Well, what we did um, when we first met, you know, we started to look at the financial situation analysis part one, you know, which was to do with consumers coming in to see you. And remember, we did the case study, um, John Edwards, who was in a bit of a dilemma, and we were trying to sort him out. And we talked how important it would be of trying to go through a budget to budget with them. We talked about the difficulties of trying to get uh, the, men on it, the men on our planet to actually do a budget. I mean, some of them have got most of the pot. business is performing. 
recorded. So that's the whole purpose of the ratios. The ratios will help us get what I like to call the track record of the business. And the lady who's from the legal background, she stopped me on that expression. Um, track record simply means, you know, looking at the background performance of the business. How's it been performing? You know, how long has it been in business? Etc. Etc. How's the performance? Is it getting steadily better, or is it like lots of businesses, quite volatile? You know, they'll have a good year, next year might not be so good. You know, they might have two or three good uh, years of progression, and then something else might happen. So it's not a textbook exercise. You know, it's a real exercise based on these people coming in to see you. So we have ratios like sales growth, gross profit, operating profit. Moving on to page uh, six, pre-tax profit. And then we had some balance sheet ratios on the next page. I'm not going through these step by step because we're going to do them in a moment on the case study. So they are from the balance sheet. And then we started to have some ratios where some of the figures are from the income statement and some are from the balance sheet. For example, ratio number five where it says stock turnover in days where the stock or inventory is going to come from the balance sheet but the cost of goods sold is going to come from the income statements so so just to recap we'll have some ratios that are working from the income statement some from the balance sheet and some ratios where there'll be a combination from the income statement and the balance sheet to give us again performance data and that that bit's all hard work and there'll be some financial ratios as well and then the idea will be when we get all that data extracted then we're going to start to say to ourselves well, what does all this mean so the way to get very practical with this is to look at the case study clothing imports which i hope you've got in the folders there Yeah, that's great. So your clothing imports, and has Miguel provided you, I hope he has, with the ratio sheet template that looks like this, it's on the screen now? Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay, now, now what we usually recommend when we do this is, for example, the ladies on my right, I can see two of you there, you try and work together on it, and then on the left hand side, again, work together uh, as a little team because if, if this is the first time you've done it, it's a bit tricky, you know, two heads are better than one using the expression there. And what we're going to do is I'll work with you on the first year ratios, so we'll do that together, and then what I'll get you to do is year two and year three, you know, so, so you'll know uh, definitely where these figures are coming from. Um, sometimes, you know, the accountants will have already prepared this for us, and sometimes, you know, you'll have to try and extract these figures yourself. Sometimes a business customer might be pretty good on this, and they'll have worked the figures out. So this is a bit of juggling. So what you want is the case study. So maybe you need to take that out of your folder. So the case study, and then I'll the side that we need the ratio sheet because we're going to go jumping back forwards between the two, which is what I'm trying to describe. And then you're also going to need to refer to how these are calculated. Okay, so put the name on the ratio sheet, clothing imports limited. And then we've got year one, year two, and year three. And you can see at the end we've got a comments column, but we can't do that until you know, we've extracted the three years and seen what sort of trends we're seeing. Now, now the first ratio, if you look at the sales growth ratio by definition, you'll see we need the sales in the preceding year. So the problem with year one for sales growth is we can't calculate that because we don't you know, have a preceding year figure. So what I'll do for sales growth is I'll do year two with you. So just put a dash in the box on year one. Second. And then move to year two. We're going to 
nearest decimal point, 3.7, yeah? Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in net sales and sales are kind of the same, right? Just so that people get just, confused. It's, it, it's just the same, yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 We're just going to do yeah. two yet. What I want to do with you is year one, right through every ratio, and then I'll let you guys do year two and year three together. Now, if you just look for a second at the income statement, can you see we're gradually working our way down? So we look at the gross profit, and now we've just been looking at the operating profit. Mm -hmm. So the next one we're going to look at is the profit before tax, yes? Mm -hmm. Pre-tax profit margin. So what we're doing is an analysis in detail of the income statement. Now you can do this on any business. You know, this could be Atlantis Hotel, right in front of you. It could be John Ball, well, in the street there. It could be a, a little sandwich store. It doesn't really matter. Any type of business, you can use this methodology to see how they're performing in the income statement. So the next one is profit before tax, which is $25,000 divided once again by sales, so all the time we keep going back to the sales, the top line position, and then multiply that by 100, and you should get, I think, 2.8%, anybody get that? Yeah. Great, 2.8%, and then the final one to look at uh, is the net profit. Now, can you see on this particular accounting presentation, it's called attributable profit after tax. But you can see it's the bottom line position. So if you want to write against that $17,000 net profit, so that's the bottom line, that's the net profit. And this is what we're going to work as a final ratio there. Net profit margin will be $17,000 divided by the sales of 900000 multiplied by 100 and I, I get 1.9 percent. Is everybody okay on that so far? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're getting the idea, you've got the definitions, you've got the case study and you've got your summary sheet so it's a bit of a juggling act, you know, working these things out. But when you've done it uh, year two and three, you should have a much better idea. No, the net profit margin is on two per year. So how is that? This is pre-tax. This is pre-tax. Yeah, operating income. This one a month. Three thousand. Then you divide that by year. Your revenue. I don't have the phone. No, the net profit margin is in the. So he gave it to us. Yeah, yeah. It's on the other sheet. It's on. Okay, because it wasn't done today. Yeah, it's on the other sheet. Of course, that's a very important profit margin. You know, what's the bottom line position? Net profit to sales is a key business ratio, and of course, it will vary dramatically, you know, with different businesses, and you gradually build up your experience on that as you deal with different businesses. You see there's different levels. Now, the next three ratios on your summary sheet, can you see there, working capital, current ratio, and quick ratio. Now, these are all what could be grouped together and called liquidity ratios. So these aren't income statement ratios. These are all from the balance sheet. So this time, what you need to do is you've got your definitions handy, but this time we need to move to the balance sheet and make these calculations for year one from the balance sheet, which is what I'm going to do with you. Mm -hmm. Alright, I just want to just quick. I'm just going to mind a little bit. Alright, so sales from year two was 6.6 six point six seven. No. 16, 16, sorry, 16.6. Yeah. 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 You're going straight down. This first call. No, I know, but the first one we did year two, yeah. And then year one, the, I'll get in there. It's a zero because we're down to the same year. Yeah. 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 Yeah
He just round up, okay. And then the air tax is 2.8, and then the and and margin is 1.9. Correct, that's very good. Now, what we tend to do, because because we're trying to make this as practical as possible, we don't want to be talking to the client, oh, your net profit margin was 1.89% because it's too... It looks too academic, so what we tend to do is where it is to round up, you know, yeah, points. Is, okay. is, um, we round up to one decimal, yeah. that the, 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 the pre-tax profit I'm on. Okay. Yep. So we round, we round to one decimal, that is the pre-tax. Pre Sorry, everybody's talking oh, the same time. Sorry. Question. I was saying that we round to one decimal rather than two. Correct. Yeah, because it looks too academic if you're talking to the business client. And you're saying, oh, your net profit margin is 1.89%. You know, they'll think you're just taking very academic approach. Experience shows okay. it's best just to do it to one decimal point. Okay. And then later on, when we still, where, when we get down further down the ratio sheet, can you see where it says trade debtors, stock inventory mm -hmm. in days? Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to use a point of a day. So when we talk about days, you know, we're going to round it to the days, you know, because it would be silly to say to the customer, oh yeah, we see you take down your inventory over in 21.36 days, and, you know, come over with stupid. So, so we try to do it. So I'll keep you correct on this. Okay, so, so the three from the balance sheet, look, working capital. Now this is a straight textbook accountancy definition. Working capital, using the accountancy definition, you can see is current assets, minus current liabilities. So if we look at year one in the balance sheet, you've got current assets, look, total current assets, two hundred and eighty five thousand dollars. And we're gonna deduct from that the total current liabilities of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And the accountant's been very kind because he's actually done done it for us uh, where they put net current assets $35,000 is the answer, yeah? Mm -hmm. So working capital, another word for that is net current assets. So working capital is $35,000 in year one. The calculation is current assets minus current liabilities. Everybody okay on that? Mm -hmm. Good. Now the second one, the current ratio, is where we use the same two figures, but this time we base it as a ratio, so from your ratio definitions, you'll see the current ratio is the current assets, and this time we're going to divide by the current liabilities to express this as a percentage. And I'll, ex I'll explain why we do this in a moment, but just for the moment, let's do the calculation. So in your calculator or your cell phone, current assets is $285,000. And we're going to divide that by the current liabilities of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and we usually express this as a ratio to one so i get one point one to one on this first calculation let's see what you get yeah i got something mm -hmm. excellent so one point one to one so so what does that mean well what that means is the current assets are slightly more that the current liabilities and expressed as a ratio in the 1.1 times as much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 1.1 to 1, yeah. Now, now, if you want to make a note, traditionally, traditionally in corporate finance, traditionally, in you know, many years ago, we would be looking to try and get a ratio of 2 or even 3 times. The reason being we would look we would look to try and have a good surplus of current assets over the liabilities that the business owes. But times have changed a lot. So quite often you'll find the ratio is quite a tight ratio as you see in there. Now the quick ratio, can you see the definition of that? This time we're looking for the assets that can be more quickly turned over into cash. So what we do here is we deduct what we think will be the slowest moving asset, which generally is the inventory. So this time you're going to take the current assets, which is what we had before, 
285,000, and we're going to deduct the inventory or the stock of $135,000, and you can see again the accountants can do numbers for us, and he's got quick assets, look, $150,000. So this time we're going to divide that figure by the current liabilities. I have a question. Is that $150,000? Yep. Um, yeah, $150,000, yes. The formula itself says current assets, well, the one on page seven says current assets which may be easily liquidated, right? Yeah. And I'm yeah. looking at the balance sheet, and the balance sheet speaks to um, quick assets, yeah. stock, and, yeah. and then yeah. nothing in work in progress. And I'm thinking that stock is not easily moved. That's right. That's why we deduct stock so we get the quick assets, yeah? And that's what the accountants do. On this presentation, can you see he's classifying cash and debtors, that's the receivable collections, as quicker assets to realize than the, than the inventory. Yeah? So he's put that's the. Yeah. 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 Okay, got it. Yeah, the first time you do this, it's really quite strange. That's why I promise you, once you've done it once, and then when you're sitting with your partner in a few minutes, doing it as a little group, on year two and three, you'll get an understanding of where these come from. Um, what, what we used to do when we first started this program, we used to, just to give you a print uh, of these being calculated, but we found with experience, people didn't really understand where these figures came from which made it very difficult if you're having a discussion with a client. So what we found on the best way of doing it is to make do this painful experience okay. of actually extracting them yourself, you know, so you know where these things come from. And, okay. and I think it's and I think it's beneficial because then you yes. can make sense of the numbers. Oh that's right. So so divide yeah, so I get points. Yeah. So, so you got one point oh seven? No, I get zero point seven. It's six to one. I get yeah. divided by the two hundred eighty-five. Yeah, divided by the total. Two fifty-eight. Two fifty-eight. Sorry, two hundred thousand. Two hundred fifty-eight. So two hundred fifty thousand divided by two fifty-eight. Oh, I'm forgetting. Sorry. Okay, you got that. Excellent. Okay, now the next thing, once you've got that, is hold on your breath a bit because the next, the next four ratios are where we flip between the balance sheet and the income statement. But, but, if, but these are very, very powerful ratios. If you want to put a bracket on the ratio sheet around trade debtors, uh, the stock and the creditors, put a little bracket around those three and put a star against those three, because these three ratios are very, very, very important in terms of the cash flow management of any business. So, so, so they're really powerful as a financial planner. How quickly are they collected in the debtors or receivable? How quickly are they getting over the stock or inventory? And what's the payables or creditors? Those three are very powerful ratios. You said trades. Trade debtors, stock levels, yeah. and trade creditors. That's it. Three on your sheet there. Uh, debt is the American term the definitions receivables. Stock, the U.S. definition is inventory. And trade creditors, the U.S. definition is payables. Okay. So you're going to need to be familiar with all three because you'll have clients following you know, different Can say it again? Receivables, yeah. inventory, Debtors is receivables. Stock is inventory, and trade creditors is payables. Yeah, and that's your problem as a financial planner or as a wealth manager. You'll have to accept that the international accounting standards, you know, they call these things different to the American uh, standards. And in NASA, you'll be used to a mix of both, probably. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so you do have a bit of an advantage uh, through the history. 
and the proximity of the USA. So here we go, let's do this. So trade debt is very important. How quickly is the business collecting in the money that's owed to the business? So would you prefer to think of it as receivables? That's fine. Or debtors. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the formula. And you can see the formula is debtors divided by sales and multiplied by 365 to give us this figure in days to see how many days on average it's taking the business to collect in the money that's owed to the business. So let's do that together. So using the... Debtors from the balance sheet, $150,000, yeah? Yeah. Divided by sales. The income statement, which was a hundred, which was nine hundred thousand, and then you're going to multiply that by three hundred sixty-five days in the year, and you're going to give me a debtor figure, which we're going to round up or round down to make it a proper day and not a point of a day. And I get sixty-one days. Excellent, sixty-one days. So we could just draw breath for a second and say, well, what does that tell us? Well, what that tells us is it's taking clothing imports on average 61 days to collect in the money that's owed to the business. So it's just the same in the bank, if you think about the bank, when the bank makes loans to customers or overdrafts to customers, you know, the customers become a debtor, don't they? A debtor to the bank. And one of the important things in any credit department you know, if you're doing some credit duties, is how long is it taking us, you know, to collect in this money that's due by way of credit. So it's just the same for the business person, except it's called, you know, the debtor or trade debtor or receivable. So 61 days. Now let's go to the next one. 61. Yeah. Because we wouldn't talk to the customer. Oh, it's taking you, you know, 60.36 something days to collect your debtors in. So stop. Let's have a look at that next. So stock levels, now this is where it's slightly different. It's stock from the balance sheet, which is $135,000. And this time, we don't divide by sales, but we divide by... Month. Cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold. Now, now at, at this point, I have to mention that some financial analysts divide stock, divide the stock by sales, and some financial analysts divide stock by purchases. So you've got to be careful when you're working this ratio. This is the most common way of doing it, but if you get an answer that's different during your conversation, maybe with the accountant or the business customer, you have to be prepared that you know some of these ratios, they're not strictly an exact science because some people will work them in slightly different ways. So you've just got to be always aware of that. But but for the purpose of the Chartered Banker Institute, you know, and their examination, etc., and our program, the most frequently worked method is stock divided by cost of goods sold, and then multiplied by 365, and you get 61 days. Yeah. Yeah. By coincidence, it's the same figure as the data days. Now let's. Uh, so, so, yeah, just pausing for a second, that means clothing imports are turning over all of their stock in 61 days. That's approximately two months. And you'd have to make an adjud a judgment as to whether you think that's good or not so good. I mean, two months, you know, is quite, quite a long period when you think about it to turn over the stock. If we got that sort of figure on a fast food store, you know, there'd be warning bells and alarm bells ringing because that would be a very slow turn for a food store. If it was a manufacturing business, and I can see a gentleman there wearing a nice blue cap there, if the manufacturer is making blue caps like he's wearing, well then, you know, there could be raw materials, there could be work in process in the factory, then there would be the finished good, and the finished good would have to then be sold. So. In a manufacturing environment, it's going to be much slower. This is the retail, the, this is the wholesaler that clothes, and, and we get we get 61 days. Now, the final one of these three very important ones is the cables. 
So let's look at the calculation for that. So this time it's the creditors from the balance sheet. Good morning to the ladies who to write. Creditors from the balance sheet, $140,000. And this time, can you see from the formula definition? Divided by... Divide by... Divide by... Yeah, cost of goods sold again. So let's do that. So we've got creditors of $140,000. And then we've got cost of goods sold from the income statement of $10,000. Then we're going to multiply that by 365. And with a bit of luck and good calculating, I hope you got 63 days. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so just to pause for a second on these three very important ratios, because as a financial planner in discussion, and we'll have more of the discussion when, you know, when we've got the three years figures extracted, but you can see how these three are going to affect the cash flow for that business, because if they collect the receivables in quick, that's going to benefit the cash flow. If they can turn over the stock or inventory quickly, that's going to benefit the cash flow. And if they pay their suppliers slowly, that's going to benefit the cash flow. But they've got to be careful because that can be risky in any business. You know, So it's good academically for the cash flow to pay your suppliers slowly. But in terms of a real business situation, it could be dangerous because if you upset your suppliers, they might not supply you, and then that's the end of your business. You're stuck unless you can find very quickly an alternative supplier. Yeah. Now the next one is a ratio that you'll hardly ever see, but I like I like this ratio. I like to use it, which is why you know it's in this module. Asset efficiency. And you see, this is taking the sales and dividing it by all of the assets in the balance sheet. All of the assets? All of the assets, yes. So look at the formula. Oh. It's sales divided by top, that's it. Careful, careful, that's it. I think it's... 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 I think and you're going to divide sales by all of those assets and see how many times the total assets are being turned over relative to sales. <laughs> okay, can you give me the um, the, the total assets again? <laughs> yeah, well, go on to the balance sheet uh -huh, man. and we'll do it together. So total current assets in the balance sheet, look, what do you get for that? 35,000. 35, and then look from the down. Mm -hmm. You see this fixed assets, look, the 51,000. 51,000, so, yeah. Yes, so to get total assets, you've got to add your current assets to your okay. fixed okay. to give you all of the assets in the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So then we're going to divide that figure into the sales, and I get 2.7 to 1. So I get the total assets being turned over relative to sales 2.7 times, if you prefer it. 2.7 times. Yeah. Wait to be, uh, which one, make sure you get that. What did you get? I got 2.7. So it's 86,000? We have a total. I get 900,000 for sales yeah. divided by 86,000. <coughs> what, what, what figure did you get? What is that, please? Divide by 86,000. I get 10. I get 10.46. Do you? Let me try it again. Let me find one problem. What is 35,000 plus 51,000 divided by 1.3? No, 100,000 divided by the sales. Not the sales. This is maybe. It's a couple different sheets you got to go through. That's the income statement in the balance. Okay. I get 10.4. Okay. <laughs> it's a mistake then on my sheet, and so we got okay. we've got um, the sales of nine hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. 
So seven thousand divided by eighty thousand multiplied by hundred, you should get twenty one point three percent. Twenty one point two five rounded up to twenty one point three. Excellent. Excellent. Now, what that means is we're going to discuss it in a moment or two. But let me just help you by. What you got? 21.3. 21.3. Uh, 70,000 divided by 80. And then multiply by 100%. Uh -huh. Would you want 21.3? Okay, 3, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, now let me, let me show you how this figure is originated. Now, the, the numerator is quite straightforward because it's a profit after tax, which you quickly identify from the income statement, and it tells us it's 17,000, yes? So that part's okay. The slightly trickier part is to identify what do we mean by equity because this could be a large company balance sheet and it could be quite difficult to identify. So what I'm going to do with you is applicable on any balance sheet. You know, this could be yeah, this, um, this could be uh, the Bahama development, you know, it could be John Bull, it, it could be, it could be uh, Dell Computers or whatever, or it could be Walmart. So, so by using this methodology I'm going to show you now, you can definitely pinpoint what we need to use as the equity base. So, so what we need to do is just take a piece of paper or, or a side that you're not working on and what I'm going to do is the basic balance sheet like we did before What we're going to do, I'll try and show you this. Um, I don't know if you can see this on the screen. My video is just. Let me just move the document to the side. Okay, can you see this on the screen? Or in current assets and fixed assets on the right hand side, and then total assets underneath. So, so what you need to do on your piece of paper, on the right hand side of the piece of paper, put current assets and fixed assets, and then underneath that put total assets, and then take the figures for your one, look, so for current assets, 285,000 dollars, and then you've got fixed assets, as we saw, 51,000 dollars, so total assets, as you know, are $336,000. So that's on the bottom right of my piece of paper, $336,000. Now, when we first started this quite a long time ago, um, 336 total assets. Now, when we first started this a long time ago, it was quite straightforward because the balance sheet because yeah, it, uh, the origination of the balance sheet was obviously it had to balance. So, so both sides of the balance sheet would balance, and all the accountancy presentations all those years ago were on that basis. You'd have the assets listed, and then the, on the other side you'd have the liabilities, and then the difference between the two would be the net worth yeah. position or the equity base. Now that's what we did on the personal credit, if you remember. When we looked at the personal balance sheet, we looked at the personal balance sheet, we listed the assets, we listed the liabilities, and we looked for a personal net worth. So this is just the same. So here we go. On the other side, if you look at the balance sheet, we've got current liabilities of $250,000. So this is on your left hand side. There's a paper, so we're on the left hand side now, $250,000, and then we're looking for long-term liabilities, if there are any. Yes, there are, $6,000. So, 
So if we now make a subtotal of the liabilities, we've got a subtotal of liabilities of two hundred fifty-six thousand dollars. Correct? That's what they say. Total deferred liabilities, six thousand. Yes, yeah, six thousand from the balance sheet. Yeah. It's long term. It says long term liabilities. Right. It says long term high purchase, which is installment finance. Mm -hmm. So you've got liabilities of two hundred fifty thousand. Current, and then you've got long term six, so you've got total liabilities $256,000. Now, all we have to do, whether this is a small, medium, large, or stock market listed company, all we have to do now is take all the assets away, all the liabilities away, rather, from all of the assets, and we're going to get a balancing figure at $80,000. So we've proven what the business net worth is. So the balance sheet balances, we take the 336 across the other side, take away the liabilities, and you should get a balancing figure of $80,000, which is the business net worth. And then you can just check that against the accountant's balance sheet, yeah. and you'll see that, that we're right. So by using that method, mm -hmm. it takes away the complications of the terminology because the accountants will call these things different names, yeah? Mm -hmm. is, everybody, is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you do it again on a bigger balance sheet, you'll see it's the same principle exactly. So we have all the assets, take away all the liabilities, and we'll get a net worth position. Now very occasionally as a financial planner, when you do this, you might not get a net worth position. You might get a negative position mm -hmm. and that's going to be really difficult to deal with mm -hmm. you know whether it's a person with a personal negative net worth we've got a problem there if it's a business with a negative net worth under the UK insolvency practices this this business is actually trading on an insolvent basis wow. uh, unless the directors can confirm better prospects for the business here yeah? okay. but normally, normally you're going to get a positive figure Okay, that's return on equity. Bit of a long-winded explanation. Interest cover, so the free calculation. That's the operating profit divided by interest, or PPIT divided by interest, or if you want the American definition as we discussed, EBIT divided by interest. So that's from the income statement. So into the income statement. There's PBRT look, $33,000, divide that by the $8,000 for the interest paid, and you're going to get interest cover of approximately 4.1 times. We're doing interest cover. Interest cover. Yeah, interest cover is the profit before interest and tax. Divided by the interest, which is 30,000, yeah, divided by 8,000, you get 4.1 times covered, which is quite a healthy position. So when you look at 8,000, yeah. So you've got that 4.1? Yeah. Right, we'll discuss it more detail on the other two years. The average from the income statement. From the interest statement. Yeah, divided by the interest. interest pay of the 8,000. Yeah, that's it. But anyway, we only got two to go. So, leverage, if you look at the formula for that, you'll see this time everything comes from the balance sheet because leverage is all of the liabilities. Now, it's not current, it's not long term, it's all the liabilities. So it's called total liabilities divided by the net worth position. Uh, so we've got to look at all the liabilities in the balance sheet. So there's the balance because sheet this, again. Is this a negative? We've got because this is a negative? No? Or because it affects interest? What's that? This interest pay? Interest expense. Yeah, that's interest expense is interest paid. Okay. So, so leverage. All the liabilities, so we've got current liabilities, 250,000, mm -hmm. long-term liabilities, as we saw before, 6,000, 
total liability is two hundred fifty-six thousand dollars, and we're going to divide that by the net worth position or share of the funds, which we know is eighty thousand dollars. So divide two hundred fifty-six thousand by eighty thousand, and you should get a leverage position. Three point two. 3.2, very good. So, so 3.2. Yeah. Was the total liability 256? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's correct. So you have the value at work for $80,000. So it's the current liability is just long term. Yeah. Okay. So, final one, the final one is debt fearing. You can also write against on the summary sheet the relative to the debt equity ratio. The debt equity ratio. Yeah. 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 The true definition of debt is when something carries an interest charge. So, so to calculate the top line, we're going to need to look at the balance sheet. We'll do this together. Yeah. So we're looking for liabilities in the balance sheet where the customers will have to pay an interest charge. So supplier credit, credit is look hundred forty thousand dollars. There won't be an interest charge unless they're in breach of the agreement or there's a special penalty there. So we don't want that. Higher purchase, this is installment finance. So they will charge interest. So put a circle around that $2,000, because that's going to go into our calculation. The bank, the bank's obviously going to charge interest. So put a circle around $90,000. Taxation, well, again, there won't be an interest charge unless it's a penalty situation. And then director's loans normally there won't be an interest charge unless, again, there's a special interest clause there. So for the purpose of the calculation, for the debt, we've got 2,000 plus 90,000. Oh. And then we've got to look further down. The long -term, there's a long-term liability, look. Long-term installment finance of six. So once again, that will be charged in interest. So our numerator for the calculation will be $2,000 plus $90,000 plus six, so that gives you $98,000. Then you're going to divide that once again by the net worth or the share of this funds of 80,000 to give us this final ratio calculation. I have a question. Okay, you said, you said that um, we should be looking for debt that doesn't attract any interest or penalty fees, right? No. They don't get charged. So what about, yeah, what about the director's loans? They don't get charged a, yeah. a penalty well, fee? Yeah, the problem I have is, I can't hear the question because the gentleman on the left is talking to somebody else. Sorry. So if you, no, it's okay if you give me the question again, okay. then I'll answer it again. Okay, what I'm saying is that um, we were looking for debt that doesn't attract any interest or penalty fee, right? Yeah, because, because what happens in accountancy is certain liabilities will be classified as a liability in the balance sheet, but only some of those will attract an interest payment. So the true definition of our final ratio, which is debt gearing, or as I mentioned, sometimes it's called debt to equity, you can see what we're looking for is true debt. We're not looking for a liability, we're looking for true debt. So what we have to do is this balance sheet exercise, and again the accountants you know, will help, or the customer may have done it, but we need to know what it is ourselves. So what we look for is we go through the balance sheet liabilities and ask ourselves the question, or ask the customer, if the customer is there with you, which of these liabilities are you paying interest on? And then we can put it into this final ratio calculation. So let's do it again together. So let's look at the liabilities in year one. Payables or supplier credit, 140,000. Would they pay interest on that, yes or no? 
That's the power of credit. If, if there's a late payment and there's a penalty, that would be different, yeah? So that would be a special clause <coughs> in the supplier agreement. But generally, okay. the suppliers won't charge interest unless you move into a penalty situation. Okay. So we're not going to include that as a starting point. I purchase, yes or no? Yes, I Yes, because it's installment financing. You know, it's like vehicle financing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there'll be interest, so put a circle around $2,000. The bank, well, of course, you pay interest on the bank debt. What's a higher purchase? I don't know what a higher purchase okay. Well, it's just another name for installment financing, yeah? It's just a different accountancy term. Okay. Some people call it installment financing. Uh, it's similar to leasing, leasing finance. Higher purchase is... Um, installment financing and it's generally on vehicle purchase so the bank here yeah, definitely 90,000 tax no unless there's a penalty director's <coughs> loans no unless why, there's a special clause where they're looking for interest <coughs> <coughs> yeah but I, I have a problem I, I don't understand why the director loan does not attract an interest well, that's because we haven't seen the long documentation. If there, are, if there is a factor in there uh -huh. where the directors want to make the loan charge, an interest charge, then we'd have to take it. But in, in this particular case, there isn't. Okay. And it's the same each year: ten thousand, ten thousand, ten thousand. So, so there's no interest being paid on this. Uh -huh. If there was, you can find out by inquiry. Of the accountants or the directors. And then the only other one, look, is further down. There's the long term I have purchased again, long term HP, which is installment financing of six. So does that answer your question then? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah, so if you divide that by the equity base, now you should get debt gearing of 1.2 approximately. Is that right? 1.2 to 1.2 98,000 divided by 8,000 to give you 1.2 Okay, great. Now what I want you to do now is here's your teamwork. So you've got two teams now. You know, see, it's a bit dark in your room, but I think there's three on each side of the table. So, so work together, help each other on the right hand side and on the left hand side and uh, what I want you to do is put as you can work year two and year three now we'll check our results and then then the final part will be to try and tell us well what does all this mean how is the business performing in terms of the ratios of the business so just uh, just give us one just for a few minutes bonus number 17 Debt equity. Debt equity. Debt equity. Debt equity. So start with year two. You've already done sales growth. So straight away you're off to the gross profit margin. Now, now, now it's up to you as a group whether you want to do gross profit for year two and then straight away gross profit for year three. You might find that easier than doing gross profits and net profit for year two and then back tracking to year three. Decide as a group. Oh, you want to do that? Yeah, well, I think it would be easier if you do two and three together, but it's up to you. You can decide as a group.
You put it on the thing then? On the window one point zero. This one. Oh, I don't know. Let's do it again. Yeah, let's do it again. Mm -hmm. What's the next one? Let's take it over there. It was 9 4, right? 9 4. Divided by the 1.15. Okay, now remember we bought the new one, right? Oh. So, because then you're going to do it for you. You know when you have two things? No, you have one.
No, they haven't seen it yet. Thank <laughs> you. 
That's the usual math So if it's point, point 0.553, it stays at point 0.5. Because you said we will not use goes, one decimal. Yeah. You call it point 0.5, aren't you? Point 0.5 and upwards goes up. So 5 and up go up. So point 0.55 is point 0.6. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Point five six. Point six. We're using one decimal. Okay. Sorry. We're using decimal. Yeah. We're not doing two decimals. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're, we're running slightly behind, so I think what we'll have to do is check the results we got so far. Then I'll give you the others to fill in because we need some time to talk about you know what's this showing us and what would we this without estimates the really important part. But you got it you got it the feeling for the mathematics. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let me shout the figures out. So sales growth we had sixteen point seven in year two and twenty-three point eight in year three. Yeah. yeah. Then the gross profit margin that was ten ten percent, nine percent, and seven percent. Not that? Yeah. Operating profit margin 3.7, 3.3, and then 1%. Mm -hmm. Pre tax profit 2.8, 2.5, and then we kept careful with this one. It's actually 0. Mm. Point. Did you get that? 0. 0.1? 0. 0. 2. <laughs> yeah, 0. 0.2, that's it. Yeah, 0. 0.2. So I think some people might have had one five yeah, percent instead of point one five, which is point two. Yeah. If I put point okay. two, would that get me a a, a wrong on the test? Yeah, point, point two, point two is fine. Okay. Zero point two is fine. Net profit one point nine, one point five, and zero point two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now before we before we move on, let's discuss. This whole bunch of uh, profitability, income re related ratios, yeah? So let's step back and think, now what is, what is this telling us in terms of getting to know this customer, getting to know this business? Now this is a good place to start because most business people I ever met, you know, they might not know much about their balance sheet, but they usually know about their sales and their costs. So it's a good place to start is at the top of this sheet. So what's happening with sales that are getting better at this? They're getting better. Mm. Yeah, sales are increasing yeah. quite, quite nicely, aren't they? Yeah. We know it's a competitive market. He's doing well with sales, but what about the rest of the ratios? Yeah. In that section. <coughs> They're, They're getting better or worse? Getting declining. Yeah, they going down. Yeah, they're all going downhill. So what we're seeing here is someone who is looking to expand the business in terms of sales, mm -mm. but the profit margins are dropping dramatically. And I, mean, yeah. and I mean, look at the net profit. It's not even one dollar, is it? Zero point two percent. So what that means is, if you were thinking, well, what about a hundred dollars of sales? Hundred dollars of sales. In year one, he's making what nearly two dollars net profit. But what's happening in year three? Every hundred dollars of sales, he's making what? Twenty cents. Twenty. 20 yeah, twenty cents. Twenty cents. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I like the fact you paused because you have to think about it carefully. Because at first you think, well, that can't be right. Mm -hmm. I mean, what sort of business is this where a hundred dollars of sales? He's only making 20 cents, so you know at college and school and university and whatever, we talk about like break even in business and things like that, mm -hmm. where you can see he has an illustration. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's almost on a break even point mm -hmm. uh, where he's just making a fractional profit. Mm -hmm. and, if we, and if we wanted to, be, to, to confirm that, what we need to do when we're looking at these ratios, you know, we need to make sure of the ground we're standing on because we, you know, we're going to be financial planners. So we could go backtrack to the income statement, which I've just put on the screen. You've got the income statement. Look, there's the sales, look. 900,000, a which is a hell of a lot of clothes to be selling, isn't it? And then he gets it up quite dramatically 
to 1.3 million. She's obviously working like crazy on sales, mm -hmm. and he's got it up to 1.3 million dollar of clothing sales. But what profits he making? Two thousand dollars, yeah. Use the market can't take that. Yeah, you know, you might think well, it's worth the average. You're working like crazy to make one point three million dollar sales, and you're taking two thousand dollars bottom line. So, so the challenge of the discussion with them would be to find out why what's happening with the same oh, position because it's not good. That we can congratulate them to get them starting in a positive mood, you know, the discussion. <laughs> we can say, oh, you're doing really well with your sales, you know, it's a very competitive market. We've calculated, you know, sales have increased by, you know, approximately, approximately 70 percent and 24 percent. So you've done very well there, but yeah, we're, we're a bit worried about the decline in your profit margins. And ask them the question, are you aware of the decline in your profit margins. Mm -hmm. You have to be prepared because you might say, no, well, where would you get that? Sure. Where would you get that from? Mm -hmm. yeah, so you might, you might not be aware of that. Mm -hmm. All you might be aware of is he's selling and selling and selling, mm -hmm. but he's not too sure what lies behind the figures. Mm -hmm. Now the next three sections, look, working capital, current ratio, and quick ratio, they're from the bottom sheet, and we're not going to get a lot of information out of that except to say, well, the current assets are slightly more than the current liabilities, which is a good thing. If the business is to trade, at least there's more by way of assets than by way of liabilities. Yeah, but, but there's a strong proviso there. That would, that would be, when you look at the current assets, can the current assets all realize the value units in the balance sheet? Yeah. So let's go back to the balance sheet for a moment. Let's see what these current assets are made up of. Yeah, well, you want to look at that current assets that is that he's got to have collected in. So, so 150,000 of debtors are owed to the business. The next year, 170,000. And the next year, 230,000, so that's an equivalent of a million dollars that people owe to his business. That looks quite shocking, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. you give her a question mark around that. What's going on there in terms of his debt collection? Needs a receivable. Yeah, so it needs a good receivable management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's and a challenge in most businesses that they provide services, but they have a poor collection poor process. Collection you know? record, exactly. Now, if you want to put the other figures in and the trade debtors, uh, I think you, I think you have 61 days. The next two years are 59 and 65, so it's slightly worse than the third year. Start days, you have 61 days, and then it gets worse to 73, mm -hmm. worse again to 78, mm -hmm. and the payment to his suppliers is 63 days. 69 days, which is slower payment, mm -hmm. and then 85, almost three months. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. oh, so, so again, some very worrying trends, I think you'll agree, coming through that. He's got a receivable collection problem, mm -hmm. he's got an inventory turnover problem, because that's mm -hmm. getting worse, mm -hmm. and then paying his suppliers is now, or his suppliers nearly three months, mm -hmm. and 85 days. Oh. So those three there, what do you think about his resulting cash flow. Do you think his cash flow, because of those metrics, is going to be good or bad? Bad. 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 Well done. Very well done. Bad. Now this is where I ask Miguel to prepare a print of a cash flow worksheet for you. So, so, we, so if, you, if you come back in and give you the cash flow worksheet, that would be very nice of him. He brought it already. Yeah. He brought it already? Good. So you've got it in the back. Keith, I'm going to have to leave early. Well, I, I leave 12 o'clock on the door. I have to catch a flight. Yeah, that's fine. We'll be finishing 12 o'clock on the door. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You've got 15, you've got 15 minutes uh -huh. to run. Uh -huh. Okay, now then. Now, now, right, the cash flow worksheet. Let me try and get it up on the screen. Okay, this 
And then the next year it's worse, isn't it? Look, he's twelve thousand dollars negative. Yeah. And that's before he's paid the bank. So so he had one thousand five hundred dollars, but he's gonna pay the bank interest of eight thousand five hundred. So where where's the cash gonna come from? And in the next year he's already negative, and he's gotta pay the bank eleven thousand. So all of this results in a very, very bad cash flow negative at line D. So what I want you to do is line D, underline it, or highlight it, because that's the bottom line, cash flow position in any business that we need to be aware of, and we need to make sure the accountants, you know, helping the customer identify that. So can you see our worst fears are confirmed because in the first year, although he entered uh, with 36500 he's negative $14,000 cash flow. And in the next year, he's worth still $35,000 negative. So, so but where, where has he got the cash from yeah. to continue in business? Chris. Oh, yeah, the yes. interesting. <laughs> 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 he, might have, he might have to go to his personal. Yeah, very good. I remember from before, and it's the second business. I said to you, if, if, if the person is cash negative, small business is cash negative, they've only got the three sources cash from cash reserves, debt from debt providers, or equity or new capital coming in. So write that down on this cash flow worksheet. You know, it's cash. Debt, or equity, which is new capital coming in. So let's see how he's managed to stay in business. Well, if you look at the cash, which is the bottom line there, there's no cash at zero. And you confirm that from the balance sheet. If you look at his balance sheet, right at the top of his balance sheet, look. Cash, cash balance, zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. So he's got no cash reserves. Mm -hmm. So that's not a possibility. Mm -hmm. New capital coming in. Let's look at the bill sheet. Share capital of twenty thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, twenty. So that's not an option. So his only two options are to pray, like you said, <laughs> or to go and see the bank manager. Now I suspect he's probably been doing some praying uh, with the bank manager because if you look at the bank position, you can see there's bank uh, facilities granted yeah. in terms of short term debt. In long term, and again, we can prove that from the balance sheet. So go back to the balance sheet, look at the bank position. Okay. Yes. Yep. Quick question. If he has, this would be based on the business. But based. if he has his personal assets. Yeah. Um, $100,000, yeah, time to pay them he, quick. If he can, say he has a property or something, <laughs> he can liquidate, he can sell, yep. and then he yep. can come yep. into, that would be new, that would be new capital, right? Eh? People do that all the time because it's their passion, it's their business, and they want to make the wrong decision. It is making the wrong decision, but people do that all the time. Let me have a key thing. We don't know what he's doing. 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 By injecting cash, that'll be fine. Yeah. The share capital will go up if you've got hundred thousand dollars. Share capital will go up to hundred twenty thousand dollars. And what's the opposite entry? It's the cash balance of hundred thousand dollars. Brilliant. You can now pay your suppliers down a bit. You can pay the bank down a bit, and things will be looking rosy. But that's got to be based on the interview with you having drawn these conclusions out, yeah? Mm -hmm. So the only way to progress to that interview stage is by doing the work we've been doing. Can, can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, the purpose of what we're doing today is to try to get another customer a bit better. Now, the opposite side is if he says, oh no, I've got no cash reserves, I've got no property in the background, what's going to happen next? Um, I mean, if he can prove that the business is profitable, then he can get a new shareholder. Well, let's talk again. You said if he can prove the business is profitable, where, where are you going to prove that from? 
Or oh, he can file bankruptcy, if, of course not in this country. <laughs> liquidate all his assets, liquidate whatever's in there, have a, have a clearance sale and just cut his losses. Mm -hmm. Could do, yeah. no, but hopefully it's a financial planner, that's not going to be a first recommendation. So, if your first recommendation is increase cash flow if he's got some, mm -hmm. but, will that, but will that cure the problem that he's got? No, it's not going to cure it. Yeah. It's just a band-aid. Yeah. 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 Exactly, it's a band-aid. Well said, that's just a cash flow injection. But once you change the actual trade in, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Well said, that's just a cash flow injection. But once you change the actual trade in, that you're seeing in year one, year two, year three. No, he so needs some advice. He needs some advice to help him with his creditors and his family. Identify why is he struggling? You know, it could be, like you said, it could be sector-wide, and it may not be him as a business, per se. One thing I don't understand, Keith, one thing I don't understand is I see that his administration went up. His administration went up, which could possibly mean like you hire new persons or whatnot. But what are those new persons Why? doing? Why? You've only seen that. Well, well, the 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 we hire more, more salespersons yeah. rather than new persons. We don't know. Yeah. Oh, we're going to get into the financial planning question. Because mm -hmm. you're going to the next stage of saying, well, okay. we need to look at the trading. Keith, help me up with something here. And let's identify his trading. Hi, Keith. Trading. Yeah. Um. Let me just just so I understand. Cost of goods sold yes. is his. It, it, that's his. Um, the clothing yeah, in his stores, good. and um, the the sales in each given year. What he what he's getting from the manufacturer, correct? No, he's a manufacturer, so that's something. He's not a manufacturer. He's an importer. Clothing imports, imports, ready-made clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it takes to make his product. This this is what's yeah. killing him. This is really what's killing his business. Good. How do you how do you get that? He has to figure out a way how to bring this cost down. Very good. Well said. This, no, this, no, is, this, is, this is what's it's really hurting his business. Us. We've got three minutes to go and you're getting there. <laughs> because if you look at the first page, all it comprises of mm -hmm. is a need to just building imports as a merchant engaged in some import and subsequent wholesale of ready made up fashion clothing from the Far East. Together with the majority of purchases now being made yeah, from purchases. London suppliers. The purchases change it, the suppliers change it. So, uh, okay. so there's a clue for you. In the right up. In the right up. First page. So yeah, very good. The cost of goods sold. Yeah. Is this be is the increases because he's getting too much now? London just would be much more expensive than the Far East. But regrettably now we have very few manufacturers left in the UK. Most of our stuff comes from China, mm -hmm. same as yours does. Mm -hmm. So if he's getting stuff from London, the chances are London's bought it in from China. Mm -hmm. They've they marked up the price. And so and they, they step in with the bill. The harness, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so he has to go direct to the supplier. And he took exactly. the, 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 yeah, he, so, he, he, so, oh God. So it's two main points on the trading. Which you've identified one is what the lady said at the front. What's happened with these administration and distribution costs? Mm -hmm. But that came in the past. It, 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 it can be looked at. But the other main figure, mm -hmm. see, when you do financial planning, you've got to try and get into the main mm -hmm. figures. Yeah? This sales are pretty good, yeah, but boy. So we'll show 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Up to 1.3 million. Yeah. Extremely, extremely tight. The yeah. Senegal have been pleased with this group performed it right on the key issue, which is the supply of the goods. So, that's right on it. You'd have to discuss you know, with them what you can do mm -hmm. about the supply situation. Mm -hmm. And your very other important point, how can you fix this temporary cash flow issue? Has he got any cash he can introduce? Or could he go to Miguel and ask Miguel if he'd like to inject some money into the business as a new business partner. So we get all the the multi-millionaire Ms. Mims and get the cash flow and all that. What time? Clean up time. What time? I cleaned that the day with Jesus. So what you need to do next is, you know, when you get a little bit of time, make sure you know how these things are calculated. Yes. Oh, I gotta, yeah. I got to watch this video again. Yeah, you read it through again. Well, in, well. in practice, generally, you won't need to extract. Because, you know, the business yeah. customer working with us, uh, 
the Pelican will do it, but the reason to do it this way is to let you see definitely where the hell these figures come from, and hopefully, more importantly, you know what they actually mean. I hope we, I hope we managed to achieve that this morning. So that was a bit rushed. But thank you very much uh, for the second morning. Mm -hmm. and all the so, Keith, okay, a quick question. Yeah, that would be quick. Okay, that would be quick. Um, the, the, <laughs> the, the test, when we get the, the exam, <laughs> is it going to yeah. focus on all these ratios and definitions? Do we need to know these formulas on our head? No, because it's an open book for exam. <laughs> Yeah, I'll give you more information. Thank you. I'm going to get a flight. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jackley, once again. Thursday, right? It's Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. 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 Thursday.